Good afternoon. Welcome back to the 2024 California Digital Health Summit, brought to you by the California Telehealth Resource Center. I am Sylvia Trujillo, and I am your moderator today. I'm also the executive director of CTRC. We are really glad you could join us for today's session on social determinants of health and telehealth. It's very apropos given this year's theme for our summit is health equity and sustainability. Digital innovation makes it happen. This session will really underscore how crucial digital health can be in addressing structural inequality and social drivers of health. We're gonna learn about how it could expand access, it could lead to personalized interventions. Um, the methods outlined today in this session will also um, demonstrate best practices around data collection and really at the end of the day, drive towards both patient and care team education and empowerment. Fundamentally, we think that integrating SDOH into digital health strategies can be a really significant game changer in providing a more equitable, um, efficient and sustainable healthcare system and fundamentally creating um, a, a new way of approaching health disparities. So with that, a couple of disclaimers. So next slide. Um, wanna underscore this session is purely for informational purposes. CTRC has no relevant financial interest or arrangements with any organizations related to commercial products or services discussed during the summit. Um, and next, I would like to um, give a few tips about this platform. There is a place for you to post your questions to our presenter. This session is being recorded. And should you encounter any difficulties, our CTRC team, CTRC team is here to help you. Um, you can seek help in the platform. If that's not working, you can contact us at caltrc at ochin.org. Um, we'll hold the last few minutes of today's sessions for Q&A. And we encourage you to interact with other in attendees um, on the platform, even after this session. So a couple of thank yous. Um, the first is we'd like to thank um, both HRSA and HCI for their generous um, contributions that make the delivery of these services available to you all and throughout the year. Um, none of the views expressed in this session or during any of the se sessions um, are HRSAs. They're solely those of the presenters um, or in the case of CTRC for presenting our own. Um, next slide. Uh, we also would like to thank our event partners. Um, very apropos to both our theme and our focus, um, we'd like to thank the California State Rural Health Association as well as the Digital Health Equity Ambassador Program. So with that, I would like to introduce our speaker. Um, Ned Mossaman um, has a tremendous amount of expertise, national prominence, and just a really um, quite personal and professional commitment to advancing equitable healthcare to all patients everywhere. He has been a leader at the national level in um, driving standards for the standard collection of social drivers of health, digital health data. He has been working hand in glove with researchers in understanding um, the implementation science of uh, really implementing social driver of health evaluations and referral processes and resolutions that can help patients. And really quite notably, he um, has been the lead architect of the quality measures related to social drivers of health that have been adopted by the Medicare program um, in a number of quality reporting programs. So I don't wanna um, delay too long his presentation. It is quite rich, it is um, incredibly groundbreaking. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Ned. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much, Sylvia. I appreciate that kind introduction. Uh, just a word about Ocean, the organization I represent, and we're very proud to be part of the same organizational family as CTRC. 
Uh, if you're not familiar with us, uh, we are a nationwide network of community health centers, critical access hospitals, uh, rural health clinics, public health, and, and related organizations uh, with uh, a huge number of patients under the care of our collective members. The thing I want to point out here is that we have, uh, our members have done an incredible job in the last uh, 10 years or so, and particularly in the last five uh, in documenting SDOH screening in the EHR. And this is something that uh, is relatively new. So the idea of, of our members and community health centers and primary care in general working with patients' social needs and addressing them is not new. We know that that goes back decades, um, really to the foundation of the health center movement, even for those of us uh, who work with FQHCs. But um, the notion and idea of integrating this uh, into the EHR and providing a platform and a means to uh, do this digitally um, and through telehealth and other modalities is really what's new. Next slide, please. So presumably, if you've uh, joined this session, you probably already know uh, and have heard quite a bit about social determinants of health, social drivers of health. Uh, again, you may hear them referred to as social needs, social risks, uh, or from payers, often they're referred to as health-related social needs. Um, I'm just going to use the term SDOH. We, we tend to, to uh, favor social drivers of health because uh, they're not necessarily determined. That makes it sound like they're predetermined, and they're not. Uh, importantly, these are our factors that are directly related to health disparities and health equity efforts, but they're not necessarily demographic or descriptive. They're not necessarily things like race, age, ethnicity, disability, uh, but they're things that are dynamic and changeable over time. And importantly, they're addressable in many cases. Uh, things like housing instability and homelessness, food insecurity, utility insecurity, uh, intimate partner violence, and, and more. Um, and as you can see here, the, the, the fact that only roughly 10% of a patient's health status, a person's health status in the U.S. is reflected by health and health care um, gives you some indication that uh, these social and behavioral uh, factors are hugely important in uh, creating and establishing and uh, driving patient health. Next slide, please. So uh, before I, I go get too far, it's probably a, a good idea just to talk about why, uh, in general, the, the sort of buckets of reasons that we are interested in collecting this data on, on, on patients. Uh, so there is the one that everybody thinks about, which is to be able to provide, uh, you know, uh, healthcare teams with uh, patient context uh, about their patients' lives and, and uh, allow them the capability to connect patients to resources uh, and to work upstream to address the factors that are that are um, uh, driving patients' health. But there's also a number of other reasons. So understanding areas of need in the clinic and community uh, so that you can allocate clinic resources appropriately, so that you can do policy and advocacy, so you can pull bigger levers, create partnerships in your communities. And then, of course, there's, there's plain old population. Excuse us, folks, as we are experiencing a few technical difficulties. We'll give Ned just a minute to come back online, maybe going off camera. And I will come on, Aislinn. And it looks like we have Ned rejoining, so we'll just give him a minute.
Ed, you are muted. Thanks. I promise that wasn't a coffee break. I apologies. Uh, my Zoom kicked out, but hopefully that if that's the only hiccup we have, uh, I think we'll we'll be doing okay. Uh, again, I apologize. So as I was saying, uh, the understanding that patient being able to stratify risk uh, and adjust payment based on not just the clinical complexity but the social complexity of patients is an important factor and an important reason to document patient social needs. Next slide, please. So uh, I want to touch on our experience across the collaborative and what we're learning from and with Sweating. our oops, from and with our members. Um, so I, I, I first want to say we we have a common saying at Ocean, and that is if you've seen one Ocean clinic, you've seen one Ocean clinic, and I think that's probably common not, not just in CHCs uh, but in clinics uh, everywhere. So it, particularly with regard to this work, there's a huge variety in the, the ways that people and care teams approach screening and acting on social needs. Uh, so not just in the tools used, so that there are a bunch of different screeners out there, as you know, uh, probably from PREPARE to the Accountable Health Communities, the AHC tools to a number of others. Um, and and each of those can be administered in a number of different ways. And so uh, it's not just telehealth and digital access modalities that, that we don't necessarily know as much as we'd like about how this plays out in social needs screening. Uh, it's, uh, it's in all different uh, approaches. So whether that's somebody in, on a clipboard or a tablet in the waiting room or uh, with rooming staff being screened, and then on the outreach side, it's a, a similar um, variation in the approaches. So some clinics do have CHWs or promotors, uh, oftentimes care managers and outreach specialists or social workers are being employed. Um, and in some, many cases, unfortunately, those aren't available. So uh, the point I wanna make here is that we don't know as much as we'd like to know. Uh, and Ocean has spent uh, a, a good bit of time investigating how best to do this, but what we're building is a library of good practices as opposed to saying for sure that we know uh, what the best practice is. So emerging best, best practices, I'd like to, to put a point on. Next slide, please. So as an ex example of a project that we undertook, uh, to facilitate SDOH screening through telehealth in particular. Um, this is sort of an illustration of both a really good idea and a success on some levels, and then something that didn't work out uh, for a variety of reasons, as we'd hoped. Um, we worked with a, a, uh, an expert, a research expert on social isolation uh, and loneliness, and this was work that was funded by the AARP and rolled out a, um, a text-based triage for uh, social isolation screening where uh, patients were intended to be able to receive a question that then sort of branched uh, to, based on their responses to the previous question. And then uh, the system would trigger based on the priority level of the responses. So if there's a, a response indicating uh, isolation or loneliness uh, to a significant level, then it would automatically trigger either text or in-person or phone-based uh, follow-up with the patient. The challenge was the questions were designed really well for this kind of triage but the system itself, the telehealth provider that the, or sorry, excuse me, the text messaging provider that the member had chosen, uh, their, their system didn't allow this kind of branching logic to create this, uh, this uh, flow that we wanted. So we sort of have, have learned from experiences like this uh, as much from ones that didn't work and uh, as we have from ones that have. And I would say that part of the timing of this is that the uh, the pandemic, this was right during the middle of the pandemic and uh, the clinic that was adopting the text messaging platform as a result, wasn't able to pivot to a different platform at that time. So uh, we've 
again, this is an example of something that uh, we designed very carefully. And uh, my colleague, Dave Boston, who I believe is presented on CTRC webinars quite frequently, uh, helped design this. And uh, um, we uh, ended up with a, a really good set of questions, but not a really good approach to rolling them out at that time. However, and next slide. Uh, we, you know, what has worked, what, you know, the, the, while we've learned lessons from what hasn't worked, some of the things both in telehealth approaches and in um, non-telehealth or non-digital approaches uh, are that clinic adaptability is, of course, one of the, one of the keys to being able to work effectively with social determinants, social drivers, and patient social needs. So external motivators like grant reimbursement requirements, and we'll touch on reimbursement a little bit later, that ends up being very important. Uh, and the, as is the presence of a strong champion uh, for this work or advocate. Uh, and then uh, the, the biggest commonality with groups have, have been able to start and sustain this work is starting small and then scaling up. Uh, and doing that through telehealth, uh, we know and we've seen can play an important role in maintaining and improving access. It's apparent that patient uh, satisfaction uh, with this uh, is high. So there's a high level of patient satisfaction um, with telehealth screening via SDOH. And you'll see a number of references as I move forward here. Uh, and I would encourage you to, to check out those links for more information. One of the complicating factors in this work for screening uh, is that digital access in and of itself can be a driver of health. So the, the patients who might benefit most from being provided with digital access oftentimes don't have it. Uh, and uh, are uh, experiencing disparities that create uh, challenges for them to be connected to the internet, connected to telehealth, um, and so require some more thought about how to provide this type of service without um, exacerbating the disparities that they're experiencing. Uh, and another factor that we know is that, again, I mentioned the pandemic, at the same time that need was increased and need for specifically digital means to provide and increase access to patients, um, COVID exacerbated the disparities that, that created barriers for that. Next slide. So uh, just to touch on this a little bit more, um, we did see telehealth uh, screening for social needs grow markedly at the beginning of the pandemic. And you can see that that blue line, uh, it's a small, uh, almost uh, negligible proportion of our screens uh, across OCHIN until about uh, the beginning of 2020, not surprisingly. And then it, it uh, ramps up. And it levels off. And uh, I, I think we know we have an opportunity for further screening growth and particularly in telehealth screening. Uh, but we, we noted that clinics didn't study it. They didn't uh, necessarily find resources or ways to do this screening through telehealth in ways that were had been tested or proven by others they just did it and that was one of the lessons that we saw was that that adaptability that i mentioned previously really enabled uh clinics that were able to be agile and to just start to do it uh to be successful with it uh so that's not to say that that um that there aren't challenges specifically uh to telehealth screening. And one of the, one of the uh, things that benefits this type of screening uh, is approaches that, that involve uh, empathetic inquiry, motivational interviewing, and really trauma-informed approaches so that not being able to engage with someone in the office, uh, but rather over telehealth um, uh, approaches uh, doesn't stigmatize or um, or uh, otherwise traumatized patients if you're asking about sensitive questions. Uh, but again,
It wouldn't be a conference about virtual if we didn't have some technical difficulties. Please bear with us as we try to get our speaker reloaded. Sylvia, are you available? Sure, I sure am. Okay, so um, thank you. And really looking um, at this chart, um, I've worked very closely with Ned on this topic. And so I'm, I'm able to step in um, that we know that the COVID pandemic, um, while there were a lot of challenges, there are significant opportunities to um, test um, best practices. And so with that, Ned, I'm going to hand it back to you. Apologies. I, I'm, I'm truly sorry. Uh, my Zoom we'll just keeps, keep going. keeps yeah. crashing. All right. Next slide, please. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and shut off my camera in case that's affecting it. All right. Uh, so I've talked about screening uh, up to now and in some of the challenges that we've had in establishing best practices in screening and the fact that adaptable clinics that have just found ways to do this have we, we've really learned a lot from their approaches um, but uh, the, the the efforts to uh, to act on social needs that are identified in screening has had a, a, a little bit more um, a digital a little bit more it's been a little more digitally enabled from the get-go and so uh, we know that primary care and especially CHCs, community health centers, and, and the members that we serve have been natural collaborators with uh, community benefit organizations, so the social service organizations out there, uh, and that some of these partnerships that have been created are formal, some are informal, and data has always been a barrier. The, the healthcare system has its own approach uh, that isn't shared by other sectors, of course. Uh, and even attempts to try and bridge those sectors um, have, have challenges like disparate regulatory and legal frameworks, um, different approaches to patient consent, uh, and different workflows, really. Uh, and so many uh, CBOs also don't have the resources or technological capability to engage in this work, uh, in this type of care coordination. So um, the, the approaches that we are seeing to use technology to bridge this divide uh, fall into a few different categories. Next slide. So for the first, I'll just refer to as community information exchange. So uh, there are three component services that make up CIE typically. So there is some form of a community resource directory that lists the different type of services and CBOs out there that can uh, provide services uh, and, and, and information about them to help uh, navigate and understand things like their hours and the types of services they provide and who is eligible for them. Uh, the second thing is the ability ideally to to provide closed loop referrals. So to be able to work with uh, uh, referrals from healthcare or from other social service agencies, other CBOs, and to provide uh, a notion of an accepted or rejected uh, referral, for instance, or services provided back into a system that can then update uh, the provider automatically. And then patient consent is an incredibly important piece because these are, uh, again, sort of new frontiers in, in legal and regulatory frameworks and uh, authorization and consent are incredibly important to, to provide a foundation for that. Uh, so some of these uh, can, uh, are, we commonly refer to as social service resource locators uh, that provide this kind of platform and some of them also do varying amounts of community engagement to work with CBOs to get them on board and help them use the platforms as well. And you've probably heard of Unite Us and or Find Help. Those are those sort of the two biggest national uh, organizations in this space. Uh, and then there are other community-based organizations across the country, oftentimes 
two one ones. If if you haven't heard of two one one, it was sort of spawned out of uh, the United Way years ago, and each region has its own two one one organization that provides resource uh, directory information and does, uh, in many cases, some phone based navigation or assistance to clients who contact them to, to find out about resources in their area. Um, CIEs also can provide uh, data for efforts around capacity building. So this is an important place to understand what's going on in terms of not just what are the needs and the referrals and the types of services being provided, but what are the unmet services? Where are there more needs than services available, which is a pretty frequent um, uh, outcome as you'd expect. Um, and then these solutions of, uh, of course can incorporate telehealth enabled uh, care coordination and digitally enabled care coordination um, in a variety of ways. Next slide, please. So uh, again, I, I touched on some of the challenges about capacity, uh, but from the CBO sector, I also wanna point out that um, the trust in the health sector is often not where we would want it to be because partnership hasn't, hasn't necessarily been um, effective in the past. Uh, there is a perceived medicalization oftentimes uh, towards in, in these efforts towards working with CBOs. And then uh, importantly, they're not engaged at the start as true partners. Um, they're sort of uh, after an initiative is already spun up, they're brought in oftentimes. Uh, and so a, a piece of advice on creating these partnerships for telehealth or other efforts is really to engage with CBOs and other partners and stakeholders as, as early as possible uh, and not to just bring them in as, uh, uh, as again, as an afterthought. Uh, I touched on the legal and privacy frameworks. Um, I, I also want to note that, that telehealth can help or harm patient trust. Uh, so we've seen that it's very acceptable uh, when it's done in a patient-centered and patient-focused way. So if you're, I think the, the, the notion is that if you're meeting the patient, if you're using telehealth to meet the patient where they are, to do social needs uh, screening or action or referrals, that it's very acceptable. Um, if you're using it to um, make your life easier and blast out uh, a bunch of uh, referrals via a portal or screeners via a portal, it, it doesn't necessarily work as well. And again, keeping those patient-focused and trauma-informed approaches in mind uh, is a demonstrated success factor. So we've seen an uptick, especially in these social service uh, resource locators in the use of them in the last uh, four or five months. And I, I think uh, this is a, a, an overall point for this presentation, which is we're at sort of an inflection point where uh, a number of things are coalescing. And I'll talk about reimbursement in a moment. Um, but a number of things are coalescing that are creating an infrastructure that are allowing this work to finally proceed. I think for, for a number of years, uh, there's been uh, a, a lack of capacity or a lack of uh, incentivization through reimbursement or a lack of uh, foundational infrastructure. And slowly these are all being, these issues are being solved in various ways. Um, so we're at, at something of an inflection point and this is a good time to be doing this presentation. Hopefully Zoom won't cut out on me again. Next slide, please. So again, I touched on, just mentioned reimbursement. Uh, there is a large amount of activity in this space. So one thing that we've seen uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, but really in the last couple of years is pairs, especially more frequently taking direct care coordination roles uh, in uh, working with patient social needs. Um, and in commonly, uh, unsurprisingly, telehealth and digital approaches uh, are the way this is done because they don't necessarily have that prior face-to-face -face relationship at the payer level with patients. So when they in, in, uh, employ a care coordination a coordinator to work out and and um, and collaborate with a the patient, uh, they're typically doing it uh, with a, a pretty big panel. Uh, they're doing it through telehealth, through other digital approaches often. Uh, 
Um, and then the, uh, the other, uh, both regulatory and um, association activities. So the Telehealth Expansion Act of 2023, that made some of the, the pandemic era telehealth rules permanent and re removed many of the cross state restrictions for some telehealth services. Uh, the American Telemedicine Association may already have, have, have seen that they've released a, an SDOH toolkit last fall that has a collection of tools, including calculators and uh, composite metrics that you can sort of drill down on a geographic region and understand um, the the composite needs of that area. Uh, and then there are most recently a number of reimbursement codes that have been uh, introduced through the 2024 uh, Medicare physician fee schedule. Uh, next slide. And I'll spend a moment talking about those. Uh, these are really important. So this is a CMS putting the infrastructure in place or at least the, the skeleton of the infrastructure in place to reimburse directly for SDOH work. And uh, that's both uh, whether it happens in telehealth or not. Um, but it, uh, the, the first is through the G code that they've expanded. So uh, it can be coded as part of ENM, behavioral health or the annual wellness visit. Um, and it, it requires administration of an evidence-based SDOH risk assessment, uh, not more than every six months. And this has been granted permanent status on the Medicare telehealth list. So this assessment doesn't need to happen in person, although it is assessment, not screening. So it has to be tied to a known or suspected SDOH need that's interfering with the diagnosis or treatment of a patient's condition or illness. Uh, and there is, is also the expectation of follow-up uh, for identified needs. So referral, navigation, integration, these types of activities. Fortunately, on the next slide, uh, you can see that there all, also uh, are, um, oops, uh, next slide, please. You can also see that uh, the MPFS also has care management code uh, updates that include community health integration and navigation under G code 511. So uh, commensurately with with a screening reimbursement, there's now uh, a uh, code that allows for Medicare uh, patients to be uh, to have reimbursement for uh, assessment, care community, care coordination with community-based services, health education, and other types of tailored support. And again, this can happen via telehealth, um, it, and it can be billed for up to 60 minutes per calendar month. Um, and it does need to happen uh, via a CHW, a community health worker, or social worker, or other appropriately trained care team members. But again, this can happen via telehealth. Next slide. So uh, just to, to provide some of the takeaways, I think as I touched on in the middle, this is really a good time to be giving this presentation, uh, Zoom issues notwithstanding. Um, so we know that we don't understand as much as we would like to yet about best practices for telehealth and uh, social needs screening. Then it's been slow to develop. And, and some of the biggest uh, increases in our knowledge around this have been through the pandemic. Um, so one silver lining um, has been the, uh, the resourcefulness that we've seen in our clinics and elsewhere as, as uh, care teams have just figured out how to do this work, and they've used telehealth to do that. Um, and so we know there, that that's been helpful, but there's much more work to be done. Um, so I, there's a huge growth right now, as I touched on, a, a, a coalescing around acting on patient SDOH, both in the measurement space, in the uh, product and platform space, in the interoperability space that's allowing this to grow rapidly. And I think we'll see those and other drivers continue to push this uh, in the next 12 months um, and really continue to see that growth for a while. And then lastly, the real driver in, in you know, reimbursement, payer activity, uh, these are really the things we know that often are what it takes to get things done. If it's not paying, uh, people aren't uh, being paid to do it. If care teams aren't being reimbursed uh, in clinics to do it, it's not happening. So uh, payers 
uh, are embracing telehealth and digital tools to address social needs uh, and the infrastructure for reimbursement is coalescing and CMS is uh, continuing its commitment and reiterating its commitment to build that infrastructure for reimbursement around social needs activity that includes digital, digital modalities and telehealth. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to Sylvia and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ned. So looking at our time team, I'm doing a time check. Um, it looks like we have about 10 minutes, which is fantastic. And Ned, I want to ask you, as we think about um, using telehealth um, to uh, really provide increased opportunities to address social drivers of health, um, what would be, thinking about if the implementation science of it, what would be the first set of questions you as a clinician champion or as an operational lead in a clinic, what are the questions you would ask to assess whether or not this is right for implementation in your practice with your patient population? Yeah, so I, I think you've touched, and, and let me just say I'm not a clinician, so I'll, I'll, I wanna put that disclaimer out there, but on the operational side, the first thing I, I would ask is, uh, is how, you know, what, what do our pa current patient, what's the makeup of our patients and what uh, types of needs are we screening them for? And then, uh, you know, if uh, I think for So with that, um, that I, I think uh, uh, three times is a charm. So Ned, you cut out um, for a little bit there. So just top level, um, you're asking, I, I've come to you, I'm asking you, I have a clinic, I have a fair number of patients with a high level of social complexity. Um, we believe they are facing many social drivers of health. Um, how do I evaluate whether or not um, telehealth is the right tool to do these assessments or how do I integrate that as an option for, for staff um, given the Medicare reimbursement requirements around it? Yeah, so the, the first thing I would say is that I, I would make the assumption that it is, uh, you know, I'm, uh, so if, it, it, this is this allows you to be more high leverage in your outreach for one thing, uh, and also to address disparities uh, among patients who maybe have transportation issues or otherwise aren't able to um, to get to you in person. So this allows uh, telehealth approaches will allow you to screen a uh, broader range of of folks who maybe aren't going to be able to make it in for a visit. Um, and, you know, with that information that you glean from that, uh, the ability to act on and provide services to them um, uh, is, is all, you, you'll have a better picture of your, uh, the needs among your patient population at that point as well. We have a specific question from Jamie. Can you tell us if the G codes are billable for naturopaths and NPs as well as MDs? Yeah, so as long as it's a Medicare uh, patient uh, and you're a billable billing provider that's accepted for Medicare, uh, then yes. So I just want to underscore a key component of what Ned said. Um, you would have to be um, permitted to bill under the Medicare program currently. So if you're not permitted to bill under, said another way, if you're not permitted to bill under Medicare, currently this new coverage expansion does not obviate the existing Medicare um, provisions governing who they will reimburse and who they will not reimburse. So that's really important to keep in mind. And so Ned, on that note, um, uh, you know, a fair number of the members of the OCHA network that were screening, they weren't get, getting reimbursed um, necessarily for these services. 
So as they look at Medicare and a pathway to reimbursement, does it look like implementing it only for Medicare would be beneficial or do they want to consider a more holistic approach with the possibility that there could be coverage in the future under, um, in this case, Medi-Cal, which by the way, just a spoiler alert, last legislative session, um, the California Family Physicians successfully got legislation passed, but not signed by the governor, unfortunately it was vetoed, um, that would cover screening um, for social drivers of health in all uh, programs, including the Medi-Cal program. And that bill has been revisited and is moving forward. Um, so uh, to your question, Jamie, I will ask um, Ned, but the, the short answer is um, for Medicaid, they are not paying for screening. That is in the legislative process. But Ned, are any private payers reimbursing uh, to screen for social drivers of health that you know of? So none that I've seen, and, and what I what I want to say is that to address your question and Jamie's is that um, C CMS has sort of put a flag in the ground uh, by creating these G codes and um, or allowing them to be used for for SDOH screening and reimbursement. And uh, generally, when they create HIC picks at level two codes or use G codes in this way, uh, it it encourages uh, the AMA to create commensurate CPT codes. Uh, and so again, CMS can't, uh, can't do that on their own. All they can, all they have the ability to do is to, to use these G codes or to create HICPIX level two codes uh, that then apply only to Medicare patients. Um, but generally speaking, uh, Medicaid and private payers follow on what CMS does and what they uh, choose to be to code and create as as reimbursable codes, and so um, the the expectation is that both Medicaid, state Medicaids, and uh, private payers will be able to take advantage of this uh, infrastructure. But it's this is a first step. So no, they can't bill. Um, Right now, I'm not aware of any private payers that are are using those G codes at the moment, but I expect in the next six and 12 months that to change. Great. So we would like to thank you, Ned, for a terrific presentation and so timely and relevant to the focus of this particular summit, but moving forward in the state of California, where there is a demographic, um, really a diverse and um, socially complex um, set of patient populations in the safety net where this is going to be a potential game changer for addressing those needs um, for patients who otherwise would not have access or the ability to um, get the type of screening that this offers potentially to them, particularly if they're getting um, their other services through a virtual interaction. And of course, this would be um, contingent on those other services that you could do that screen. So with that, we'd like to thank you and we will see you again soon. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.